Hey friends, chapter 11, section 1, Africa and the Bantu. I love studying the history of Sub-Saharan Africa because I think it really makes us contemplate this question, um, how is history actually written? Like, why does our textbook say what it says? So I will hopefully try to address that in the course of this video. There's a lot I want to cover, so maybe give me like 12 minutes or 13. Your time is important. Uh, but first, of course, geography is going to play a crucial role in history, and to show you that, I will try to emphasize, whoops, I got to get rid of my other slides, how large Africa is. This website takes you to a website called the True Size Of, which shows you just how large countries are. Um, it allows you to pick up countries and move them next to other countries to compare them. So you can see how big one country is compared to another. And in the case of Africa, the mighty Sahara, the desert in the northern section, you could take the United States of America and fit it into this section. So it would be like going from Washington, D.C. all the way to Los Angeles in desert. So um, that will just kind of emphasize how big it is. Also, this link takes you to a list of the largest countries in the world by size. So it's like Russia 1, Canada 2. But then when you go down the list, lots of countries are in Africa. Um, a majority of them are. I think you have to go to the 45th country. Ukraine is the largest country in Europe. So yes, Africa is big. The Sahara is going to act as kind of this like natural border between um, civilizations in Europe and the civilizations that will be in sub-Saharan Africa. So it's kind of like this natural boundary. It was very, very difficult to cross the Sahara, um, even though in the next section we'll read about a king who actually went all the way um, here into Saudi Arabia. Um, and also to naval technology wasn't yet at the point where you could sail around um, the Sahara. So here's my wonderful boat, um, but it will be in the uh, 15th and 16th century that eventually the Portuguese will develop um, naval technology to travel around it. So there's a border between the two um, sections of the world Four major rivers, the Niger up in the Sahara, the Congo um, bisects Africa. The Nile River was, of course, um, fundamental to the Egyptians, and also the Zambezi with also some minor rivers down here, um, such as the Orange, I think is what that one is. There's a mountainous coast along the north in the Atlas Mountains, and also, too, down on this section here, making it more difficult for um, African civilizations to like build ports um, next to the water. Few major lakes, but Lake Victoria, we have Victoria Falls down here. Um, I've never been to Africa, but um, from what I've read, this is just an absolutely beautiful location then too. Um, so there's lots of natural boundaries and borders that made it more difficult for mobility in sub-Saharan Africa. But today, interestingly, Africa is the fastest growing continent and is also the youngest. So this kind of reflects a theme. Technology just continues to change the way we interact with our world. So in the past, it was more difficult to reach certain places or learn about other areas. But now um, with social media, with technology, with infrastructure, um, we can interact differently with our environment. Just one more picture to show you how big Africa is. If you take, this is the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, this country right here. And if I take it and move it up to Europe, it would stretch from... Um, Zurich all the way to Moscow and encompass the, the Baltics all the way down to the Black Sea. Just again, go to this website. It's really fun. So this section, um, I ask students, like, how, how do we write history? Like, how do historians decide what to put into your textbook? So I'll try to kind of emphasize that with this video. The first thing that we do is we take like written accounts, testimonials, or primary sources. So um, two of the most famous historians, Greeks, um, Herodotus and Thucydides wrote down historical events. They wrote down what happened and it was passed on. And, you know, um, we have this written text and they took their information from other sources or other people who had written something down, had given an interview and they said, hey, here's a chapter about what happened at this time period. Next, we have to find other sources to corroborate, compare and verify. So if 10 sources from 10, um, rely, 10 different stories from 10 sources are all saying the same thing, that's corroborating sources. 
Um, and then we craft narratives and we say, here is what we think this chapter of history was like. And then we compare those with our sources and we kind of do like this peer review. So no two history books are the same, um, but historians have the goal of saying, here's what happened in the past. But then what happens if no one writes anything down? What if the history is destroyed? What if the history is lost? Or what if there's a reliance on oral history or the passing down of information from one generation to the next captured by you know kids playing telephone? This person says, I want ice cream. They whisper it on to the next person. But by the time they get to this kid, it's let's go play PlayStation 5 or something, right? It's not necessarily the most reliable source of information. Um, if you don't have those things, we can say, okay, well, here's a tool that um, a group of people known as the Bantu used. This can tell us a little bit about how they may have farmed. Or from the last video, here was a vase that was gifted to Charlemagne by Harun al-Rashid, the great caliph of Baghdad in the ninth century. Just the elaborate detail and the, what I assume are gold and silver tells us that this king had a wealthy and luxurious life. Um, which would you rather have? Written texts or artifacts? Well, in the case of Sub-Saharan Africa, we don't have many written sources. We don't have historians who wrote down the text. So we have to rely on Indiana Jones to try to puzzle, to piece together pictures of the puzzle to try to get a picture of it. But Africa, at least, you know, we know about the Egyptians, a lot more about the Egyptians, but in terms of people south of this line, um, we don't have a great picture. So, because we don't have those sources. And I went back to the true size of, and I had a student one day who said, hey, if you take Madagascar and move it to the south of Africa, what does it look like? It looks like a question mark. And that's a bad question mark. There's a better one. But that's kind of the, the picture of sub-Saharan Africa. It's kind of a mystery. And I think this reflects a theme I think like thoughtful history should evoke lots of feelings. Um, so like some stories make you excited, some make you bored, some make you happy, some make you sad. For Africa, it's kind of like curiosity, right? In 500 BCE, we know that the Greeks were fighting the Persians at Marathon. But what was going on in present day Angola or Zambia or Zimbabwe? We just don't really know. So yeah, kind of curiosity. So for historians, we have a paucity or a presence of something only in small or insufficient quantities or amounts. For historians, we have a paucity of the kind of sources that help us to best tell history. So this is a new segment that I'm adding in. Um, if you are an educator here, like kind of some cool ideas. I've done this in the past. I've had students like write down their own personal history, sometimes in a fun, short, creative way. Um, collect some of the stories, share some of the others, destroy some of the others. This is meant to kind of symbolize at least maybe some of Bantu history um, was destroyed. Um, rip up some and try to have others put them together. That's kind of like the story of what Indiana Jones does. And then I have this game where I say like, you know, have, have you ever heard of Socrates, Cleopatra, or Joan of Arc, right? Just heard of those people. And usually like the students have. But then I say, okay, go back to ancient history. Tell me one person that lived in this part of the world. And they probably won't be able to. So just a few ideas. But what did happen? Our text tells us about something known as the Bantu migration, which was the largest migration of people ever. The term Bantu is going to refer to both a group of people and a certain language. We think and we know that, or we think that um, in villages back in ancient history, they traced their lineages through clans and lineages actually often traced their descendants through their mothers rather than their fathers, which I think can lead us to speculate maybe women in sub-Saharan Africa held a position of greater authority than did people in ancient Greece, for example. And then around 2000 BC, we had the largest migration of people ever. What happened, this is about the same time as like the Minoans, and all the way to um, 500 CE. Over the course of those 2,500 years, people started to travel and settle in different areas of Africa. 
it wasn't one continuous migration, but rather a series of people who were traveling for different reasons. Why? We don't exactly know the sole reason. Perhaps there was wars, perhaps there was droughts or famines, but a bunch of people traveled and settled in a lot of different locations in sub-Saharan Africa, again, over the course of 2,500 years. Um, I think this is the largest migration ever in human history. It lasted until 500 CE. It wasn't continual, but rather sporadic. And what caused the migrations, again, are less known, but different environments resulted in very different forms of life for people associated with the Bantu migration. So for example, um, people living in this basin of the Congo River in the jungle aren't likely to practice farming, whereas perhaps the Zambezi River makes it affordable here. This again was referred to the Bantu migration. So again, I added one more section too. Um, I say, you know, I'm of course limited in my understandings of history too. So I don't, I don't know at all. I want to know. Um, so like, I know that um, English is a Germanic language. Italian is a Romance language. So are various languages spoken in Africa Bantu based? Um, so someone living in um, Kenya versus someone living in Angola, can they both trace their languages to kind of, kind of this like common um, set of Roman of languages like a romance language. I don't know if someone knows the answer to that. I would love to know. One last thing. What can other sources tell us really, really fast? I said earlier how the Sahara was kind of like this wall between um, European societies and sub-Saharan African societies and that they never interacted with one another, but that's not the case. Um, this textbook, which I highly recommend, it's called King Leopold's Ghost. It's going to be a movie in a couple years. Ben Affleck is directing it. I'm really excited. By Adam Hochschild. Hochschild? I just looked up how to pronounce his name, but I think I may have forgotten it. But he talked about um, sub-Saharan African culture um, and the wood carvings. Here are some illustrations of African art from the Met. And its discovery had a strong influence on artists such as like Pablo Picasso, who subsequently kept African art objects in his studio until his death. This is one of his most famous paintings, uh, La Demoiselle de Avignon, which I pronounce probably incorrectly because my French sucks. But it's one of his most famous illustrations, one of his most famous paintings. And here you can see that there's like a direct link um, between an object from sub-Saharan Africa and later on European art. So there are connections between the two. Geography made it impossible for a long time, but eventually we can see um, direct implications between the different subjects. So that was like 15 minutes long, but I'm really excited about this section. I hope you enjoyed it.